Good morning again. I'm so happy uh, to be with you this morning. As TJ said, my name is Gary DeBoard, and I am uh, the kids pastor here at our church as well uh, as the missions pastor um, as well. And I get the uh, privilege to um, be responsible for both of those programs. And if you think that maybe um, the uh, kind of the, the relationship between kids and, and missions is a, little, is a little odd, you'd be right. It's a little diverse, um, but I love it though. I really wouldn't want it any other way. I, um, I like it because there's just, again, so much diversity in my job. You know, one day I could be uh, meeting with a, a missionary from Africa, and then the very next day I could be in the nurseries fixing a diaper genie. So, I mean, uh, tons of diversity, and I love it. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of a church that supports me uh, in the calling that I believe uh, that God has put on my uh, life. Now, I've been a kids pastor for uh, right around 10 years, and I kind of hate to admit that, uh, because at best, it means I'm not young anymore. Uh, but, but, you know, in, in 10 years of doing something, especially with kids, you learn a lot about kids. And I've come to understand a lot of things about kids, m- much more than I have time to share with you this morning. But uh, I just want to share a couple of those things. Uh, one of those things is I dread uh, in a classroom uh, the sound of a sneeze. Kind of weird, right? But I can't tell you the amount of times that this has happened to me. So, um, all kids have this condition when they sneeze. They just can't control their, you know, uh, mucus in their nose for whatever weird reason. And, and the amount of times that I've been teaching or in a classroom, this is just burned on the back of my eyeballs. Kids with their cupped hands after they sneeze coming away from their mouth. And what they reveal is just like a horror show. You know, it's just <laughs> so terrible. It's so awful. I have so many stories about Kleenexes and snot and all kinds of gross things. Uh, but another thing is Band-Aids. Do you know... Over 10 years, how many band-aids that I have put on cuts and scratches that never existed? <laughs> so many band-aids we've gone through. Uh, another one that I think is hilarious, actually, is, is water fountains. So kids have this amazing ability to walk up to a water fountain, uh, bend down, get a drink, walk away, and look like they've been sprayed by a water hose. It's amazing. They have this ability. It, it re- repels from the mouth and it tracks their shirt. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. But... Um, before uh, I scare all the prospective volunteers away from kids' ministry, uh, for all of their curiosities, and I include my kids as well, there isn't a group of people in the world that is more receptive to the gospel uh, than our kids. And um, what we do down in that part of the building and in TJ's part of the building on Sunday morning is one of the most important things we do here as a church. We value it. In fact, we, uh, we hold it as a kingdom Uh, mentality here. Um, And I believe deeply to the core of my being that what we do is worth every sneeze, it's worth every wasted band-aid, and it's worth every towel we waste because kids spill everything. Uh, But but it's worth it all, uh, and I'm so grateful uh, to be a part of that, all right? So we're going to be in the book of Philippians this morning, so if you have your Bibles or your devices, go ahead and turn them Uh, to uh, the book of Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 1. While you're getting there, let me set this up a little bit. So in the last number of weeks, we have been talking uh, about the book of Philippians. Um, And if you've been here, you'll know that uh, the author of the book of Philippians is the apostle uh, Paul. But But the huge thing about Philippians to always keep in mind is this piece of context, is that Paul is, as he's writing this letter, is actually in jail. All right? uh, so um, Paul doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He, he believes that God could save him, but he doesn't know if God's going to save him from jail. And the crazy thing is this doesn't change Paul at all. He's still writing these things. And ironically, your kids uh, have been learning about Paul for the last couple months as well. And one of the themes that we've picked up on is this idea of why doesn't Paul just stop? Paul has been arrested more times than he can count, been beaten more times than he can count. For the last 20 years of his life up until this point, he's been harassed almost constantly. Yet Paul does not stop sharing the gospel. And if you can get your kids in a really honest moment, hopefully they would say to you, as you would ask them the question, why doesn't Paul just stop? They would say, because Paul loves Jesus. And you see, Paul is absolutely persuaded that this gospel message he is preaching is worth even more than his life. And the the idea and the the deep feeling behind that is exactly today 
uh, what we're going to talk about. So let's uh, jump in. Uh, As I said, Philippians 3, verse 1, we're going to read all the way through verse 11. Uh, So here we go, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. And listen to this, put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, says Paul. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, I'm Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from, the God, from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him unto death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Today, I want to frame our message around one simple question, and it is this. Where do you put your confidence? Not the everyday kind of confidence, but the kind of confidence that gets you out of bed in the morning. The kind of confidence that is connected to the very deepest parts of who you are. Let's uh, pray and ask God to help us answer that question as we get started. God, we pray this morning that you would make the book live to us. We pray that as we uh, study these words that um, application would jump off out of the page. uh, And that we would be confronted with where we anchor our confidences. Help us this morning. Speak through me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. This question that I just posed to you, where do you put your confidence, is one that is actually pretty personal. And in fact, the more you ponder it, the deeper uh, it will likely go in your own life. And many of those things that anchor our confidences are typically Uh, made up of singular moments or events in our lives that have been either good or bad or the outcome has been either good or bad. This morning I want to share with you two examples, uh, one from, unfortunately, my own life and the other from the life of the Apostle Paul. Um, As maybe some of you could um, relate, I grew up without uh, a father. Uh, not because he was an absentee father, but because he literally wasn't there. My dad died at a young age. I was uh, 11. And I kind of see my life in many ways uh, as two lives. The life I lived before my dad died and the life I lived after my dad died. And in those years, kind of post-dad, uh, I learned lessons that um, only pain and suffering and loss can teach a person. And those things are... Um, deeply embedded on who I am, and I carry those lessons with me even today uh, on this stage. Um, But by the grace of God, at some point in those years after my dad died, I decided that there was only one person who was worthy of my full confidence. I decided that there was only one person who I would never have to uh, worry about if he was going to be there or not, I decided there was only one person um, who I could always, always, always depend on, and that was Jesus. And I desperately grasped on to Jesus in those years, and and that has never stopped, even to this very day on this very stage. The other story is from the life of the Apostle Paul. And before Paul was the um, 
great missionary of the church, the greatest missionary the church has ever known. He was the great persecutor of the church. And many of you know this story that on the the road to Damascus from literally one persecution event to another, Jesus himself stopped Paul on the road. And he showed Paul where his confidences really were. And in that moment, Paul realized that his confidences were attached to utter rubbish, as he would later say. Things that, that, that could not anchor his confidences. And Paul's life was forever changed as he believed in Jesus. And really, the verses that we just read are kind of a behind-the-scenes look at, at who Paul was in that moment of conversion in the 20 years that would follow. And I would go so far as to say that those of us who are Christ followers here this morning, those verses should be the verses that describe our conversion as well and the subsequent years that have followed. So let's um, unpack this and see if uh, we don't all arrive at that same conclusion in verse 1. Here in the first verse, Paul is setting up the, the church at Philippi to hear something so important that it's worth repeating. And he, he kind of, in verse 2, comes out swinging for the fences, you know. He says, he says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. Now, if you're like me, you're kind of going, mm, Paul, that's a, that's a little much, right? Like, could you tone it down just a, just a little bit uh, to our 21st century ears? It's like, it's a little bit judgmental, Paul. Can we, can, we, can we take it down a little bit? But when we come to verses like this in the Bible... What do we do with them, right? Well, the thing that we need always when we're trying to understand verses in the Bible is context. And context can most often be found in the verses right around the verse in question. And this one is no different. Here in verse 3, uh, we, Paul gives us a clue as to what it is he's talking about in verse 2. The first part of verse 3 says this, For we are the circumcision. Now, as a, as a quick aside, can, can we all assume that uh, we understand what physical circumcision is, okay? I don't, I don't think the pastor needs to explain what that is. Uh, if by chance you don't know what it is, definitely don't Google it, okay? <laughs> person sitting next to you is going to be distracted the entire service. Don't do that. Um, but this idea of, of circumcision is uh, the clue that Paul gives us, all right? Now, to fully understand verse 2, I'm going to have to unpack some uh, uh, historical context for you, all right? Now, the history teacher in me is really geeking out for this moment because I've been uh, wanting to do this because I, like, love history, so thank you for allowing me to do this. Not that you had a choice, but look out for the dogs, he says. What is he saying? Well, in uh, the church in Philippi, as in many other churches, there was a group of people known as the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were an interesting bunch of people. They were Jews that held on to their uh, historical um, laws and uh, things like that. But they also saw Jesus as the, the promised Messiah in Judaism. And so they actually believed in Jesus. They were, uh, in, they were converted Christians. But what happened was instead of letting go of those historical laws and ceremonies that uh, they practiced, they held on to them. They didn't see Jesus as the one who came to fulfill those things. They held on to them and they held on to Jesus and they tried to put them together. And it didn't work out very well. Because what would happen is, um, you know, a, a, a Gentile, Gentiles and non-Jew, would, would be converted to Jesus, and the Judaizers would get a hold of them, and the Judaizers would say, it's wonderful that you have that you've found Jesus and you've believed on Jesus, but hey, bef- before you really uh, get there, before you're really part of this thing, um, there's, some, there's some fairly weighty um, laws and uh, things that you have to follow, and oh, by the way, all the males need to be circumcised. Now, you can imagine uh, that was a little bit of a, whoa, hold on. You know, that's not exactly what I thought. And for Paul, this was a huge deal. Because what the Judaizers were doing was saying in essence and in practice that the gospel was not enough. And church, let me, let me, let me tell you something about the gospel. The gospel is sufficient. 
You don't take away from it, and you certainly don't add to it. What it is is enough for us for salvation. The Judaizers were in essence saying to God, God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he suffered on the cross. Thank you that he died. Thank you that you gave him the power to come back to life again as a, as a, uh, a righteousness for us. But it's not quite enough because we need to earn some of it too. No. Paul is saying, no, 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 stay away from these people. They're they're preaching blasphemy. He says, look out for these people. But why does he call them dogs? Because that's the real rub, right? Why dogs? Well, check this out. The Judaizers had a specific name for the Gentiles. Guess what that name was? Dogs. So Paul, what's Paul doing? Paul is just flipping the insult back on them. He says, listen, uh, you guys call the Gentiles dogs because they're unclean and because it's just an insult. I- I'm telling you that actually you're the dogs. You're the ones who is flipping the gospel in a way that it should never be flipped in. And so he says, look out for these people. He says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What's Paul talking about there? Paul is talking about the act of circumcision. He's saying if if you depend on circumcision as some means for entrance into heaven or God's love or salvation, you're absolutely wrong. It's akin to mutilating the flesh. Verse 3, he says again, for we are the circumcision. Why does Paul go back to that? Well, he's not talking about physical circumcision. He's talking about this idea that we understand as circumcision of the heart. The Old Testament talks about this a lot, and it's the idea of a a physical cutting off of what was dead and and, um, so that that new life could uh, appear. So he says, we are the circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God. Glory in Christ. And listen to what he says. We put no confidence in the flesh. Now, Paul's understanding that all manners of external salvation apart from Christ alone holds no value. Now, this is where it gets a little personal. You um, have pondered this question a little bit, and perhaps you've come in your mind uh, to a confidence that you have that is kind of really outside of Christ, that maybe a stand, stands opposed to Christ. Unfortunately, I have another story to share you about myself. Um, this week, uh, my son Max started school for the first time on Thursday. He's kindergarten, um, loves school. He's so social. He, he's been looking so forward to it. Had great Thursday and Friday. Had great days. Can't wait to go back to school tomorrow. He was totally fine. But his dad was not. <laughs> In any way, shape, or form, actually. You see, his dad really struggled because his dad has learned over many years to find the path of least resistance in life. His dad has learned because he never wants to experience the kind of loss and hurt that he's felt before to be completely and totally risk adverse. So for many of you, uh, the idea of your kids going off to school would be an absolutely fantastic day. Not so for me. One of the most terrible scenes in my mind, memories that I now have in my mind, is of my son walking out a garage door with a backpack on his back that is far too big for him because they don't make them that small. With his Paw Patrol uh, lunchbox, walking out into a world in which I cannot protect him anymore. And you see, my um, desire and and honed ability at this point in my life to to be risk adverse also includes those I love the most. But Paul says, put no confidence in the flesh. Put no confidence in your ability to manage your own life, to control the things that you are most afraid of in life. He says, put no confidence in the flesh. That's hard. It really is. He goes on in verse 4 and says, though I have reason." For confidence. Paul begins to follow this line of reasoning that asks the question, well, if, if we are going to put confidence in flesh, confidence in our flesh, I have a reason to be able to do that. And he goes on to tell us his resume. Uh, he talks about his um, ancestral pedigree, his, his bloodline there. He talks about being circumcised on the eighth day, a people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Paul's 
ancestral pedigree, his bloodline was absolutely pure. All right? If, if, if Paul walked into a room based on his uh, pedigree, ancestral pedigree alone, he would be uh, the most looked up to person in the room. His pedigree of a Jewish specimen could not be uh, denied. I was reading this week as I was preparing for this sermon, and uh, Steve Lawson, an author, talked about this idea. He said, he said that, that Paul had everything except everything he needed. Paul had everything. All of his confidences were solid. All of his external um, abilities were there. He had everything except everything that he needed. And this is why verse 7 is so amazing. He goes on and he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted loss as loss for the sake of of Christ. Now this is an amazing statement coming from Paul. And, and to kind of grasp the, uh, the, the amazingness of this statement, I want you to, to picture in your minds uh, a gain column and a loss column with Paul's name over the top of those two columns. Paul has just got done telling us what is in that gain, that gain column, and it's a lot. Right? His, mes- his resume is sound. His, his uh, workings are all there. He has worked for many years of his life to pad that column, to add to it. He has page after page after page in the gain column. That's just simply awesome. But what does he do? He says, whatever gain I had. He says he took those, that resume in that gain column. Whatever gain I had, I counted as what, church? Loss. He took that gain column and he moved every single bit of it irrevocably to the loss column. And what did he replace it with? He replaced it with Christ. And it wasn't as if he could, um, you know, one day decide to go back. Once he switched, once he, 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 he forego all of those things and put them in that loss column, it was done. It was like the, the button on the computer that says, are you sure you want to do this because you can't undo it? And Paul went forward. And he said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. If that wasn't enough, he he doubles down in verse 8. And he says, indeed, I count everything as a loss compared to the surpassing worth of, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. It wasn't as if um, Paul kind of romanticized who he used to be. It wasn't as if he sat around and reminisced about all oh, the awesomeness that he used to be. No, he, he sees it and he calls it what? He calls it absolute rubbish. That word rubbish in the Greek can be translated to dumb, like literal excrement. Paul is saying that, that those things that I used to anchor my confidences to they, they are worth as much as what your dog leaves behind in the backyard. He said, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He also uses that word suffering. Do you think it was easy for Paul to do what he did, to move all of his gain column to the loss column? Do you think that was easy? No, because in this moment, as Paul is literally pinning these words, he is bearing the suffering consequences of doing that. He finds himself in a jail cell because he will not stop preaching about the gospel of Christ. He says, I count them all as rubbish. He He goes on. He goes on, he says, I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness um, that comes from my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Many times this word righteousness in the Bible can be thought of as justification. The idea of being just, being made right. And Paul is saying here, he's saying, listen, I don't want to go before God one day and, 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 um, present him with a long list of of, um, morality that I have accomplished in my life. I don't want to give him a bunch of check boxes, he said, because, because I give that to God, God looks at it, and God says, what is this? 
He, said, he would say, Paul, you've, you've missed the point. You were never good enough. You could never be good enough. That's why I sent my son, Jesus, to die for you. So that, so that you could depend on him for your righteousness, for your justification. That's what Paul is saying. Paul says, I don't want that. The kind of righteousness, the kind of justification I want is the kind where I stand before God and say, God, I have nothing to offer except for Jesus. And you know what God will say on that day? God will say that is more than enough. Because why? Because the gospel is sufficient. We believe that this morning, that the gospel is sufficient. That when, when Paul stood before God and, and all he had to, to, to show God is his belief in Christ. It was never about Paul. It was always about Jesus. And that's what Paul stood on. Verse 10 is kind of like he kind of takes a deep breath. Like maybe I need to do for a second. And he says, he says that I may know him. Just, just, just know him. Paul, Paul has written this 20 years after his conversion. 20 years of being the most virulent follower of Christ the world has ever known. And, and what is his one simple plea after 20 years? God, that I just may know you, he says. Paul's simple plea in life is just simply to know Jesus. Uh, in the book of Matthew, Jesus tells a parable uh, about a man who comes upon uh, a vast hidden treasure uh, in a field that really wasn't his. And Jesus said that with joy, the man went, sold everything he owned so that he might buy that field. Now, the parable is super simple. It's like one sentence uh, and and the, the premise itself is pretty simple, too. And the, the premise goes something like this. You can gain everything if you give only what you have to get it. And with joy, the man does this. Why? Well, because he knew that he was going to gain everything else. You see, he had only to sell it all to gain it all. And, and listen to this. He believed that what he was going to get was better than what he had. Did you hear that? This, is, this, this, this parable, ironically enough, is an illustration of the life that Paul is telling us to live. So what do we do with this? What do we do with these 11 verses? This passion that that Paul presents us with. I want to suggest to you uh, two things this morning. And the first is this. Count the cost. Count the cost. Perhaps you're here this morning and you think to yourself, Gary, <laughs> it's all a little much. You know, it's actually uh, really kind of impractical. This whole gospel idea, this whole thing of, 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 of counting what um, my confidence is in and put it in a lost column. Maybe you would say to me, how could you, how could you, how could I, how could we love Jesus so radically? And, and why? Why would we love Jesus so radically? You might say to me, I've, I've worked too hard to, to, to add to this column that I would define as my gain column. I, I've given it too much time, too much effort in life. It's just, it's just all too much to just, uh, give it up and, and somehow, I don't know, love Jesus more? How do you do that, you might ask? How could Jesus really outweigh all the things that we would count as a gain for us? How, how could that happen? Those are all good questions. And to those questions, I would say this. Jesus gave everything up for you. If you only hear one thing I say this morning, hear this. The only pedigree that was better than Paul's was Jesus himself. And yet, Jesus gave it all up. In the gain column, that was Jesus's. 
his perfect, eternal, unending gain column. What did he do for us? He moved it to the loss column and he died in order that we might live. Do you see? That's the mystery of the gospel. That Jesus in his love and mercy did everything for us. And our righteousness is there. Our justification is there. And all we have to do is by faith take hold of that. Jesus asked us to give it all up. But not before he gave it all up himself for us. We can count the cost. But it will never be higher than the cost that Jesus himself paid for us. Number two, and with this I close. See Jesus as better. Simply see Jesus as better. You know, there have been a, a few truths in my life that have completely changed my thinking and, and kind of how I live. And, and there, there's a three-word sentence that I can't take credit for, but there's a three-word sentence that um, just blows my mind every time I think about it. And it's just simply this. Jesus is better. He's just, he's just better. I am thoroughly convinced with all my convictions that the deep worth that is found in knowing Jesus is the greatest treasure you'll ever find. And it will be better than everything that life could ever hope to give you outside of Jesus. I believe it won't even be close, actually, because Jesus will be better. Today, with Paul, would you put your confidence in Jesus alone and say with Paul that in the depths of your soul that whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ? And would you, with Paul, count your gain column as absolute rubbish in order that you may gain Christ and be found in him. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning as we confront the things that, that anchor our confidences, I ask that you help us to see the truth. I ask that you help us to see that when we uh, put confidence in our own flesh, it will never lead to a place where you want us to go. And I pray this morning as we sing this next song, in Christ alone, that the words would impact us in a deep and meaningful way that would help us to see the truth of what Paul was telling us at what heights of love and what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and strivings cease, here in the love of Christ we stand, not on our accomplishments, not on our ability to, to run away from fear, but on our ability simply to hold fastly to Jesus, desperately with our whole heart. We pray this morning that you'd help us, that if there's anyone here who you are prompting to move into a deeper relationship, that you would call them to do that, that you'd move them to do that. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, may you do abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. We would only ever pray all these things in the name that is above every name. Jesus, we pray.